Hello and welcome. My name is Shezaf Rafaeli. I'm from the University of Haifa. I'm director of the Center for Internet Research here. This is a lecture given under the auspices of a Tempest cooperation, a project called ECOMIS. It's a joint cooperation among universities in Lithuania, the Netherlands, Germany, Ukraine, in Russia, and in Israel. The project is a project for preparing curriculum about electronic commerce and electronic business. And this lecture will be about the notion of dynamic pricing and auctions. Here at the Center for Internet Research at the University of Haifa, we do much research on dynamic pricing and auctions. We build simulations in the field. We also are involved in actual implementations. And what I'd like to present in this lecture is an introduction to some initial elementary concepts in auctions and in dynamic pricing that are becoming more and more important in the field of electronic business. My email address is at the bottom of this slide, as is the URL for my home page. And everyone is invited to stay in touch with me. The projects are the e-commerce project, part of Tempest, and this is the Center for Internet Research, the center of which I am a director. I propose we begin with a riddle and a joke. They are both intended to put us into the state of mind that would allow us to think about dynamic pricing in more constructive form. The riddle is the following simple question. How does one equitably divide a cake among several children? The simple case of this problem is when we have a single cake and two children. And the simple solution, widely known, is that we tell the children that one of them will cut and the other will select. This balances out the power of the person making the division decision and the person making the choice. Hopefully, if we allow one child to cut and the other child to select, uh, the division will be accepted by both as fair and just and we will minimize the number of tears and the amount of anguish. The riddle, though, is a little bit more complicated. How do we divide such a cake among more than two children? What is a solution that would be equitable and just and acceptable when there are more than two children? The two children solution is not that easy to generalize, and the problem is a, an essential elementary problem of allocating scarce goods. It is an essential problem of managing in a business environment, and that is why I raise the question. I won't solve the riddle at this point. I will leave this question open, and maybe you can think about it for a while. Hopefully, in the course of this lecture, we will come to a solution. So how about the joke? Let's tell the joke. Yesterday, I visited the local supermarket. Here's a picture of that supermarket and as seen from behind the shopping cart. And I pushed the shopping cart down the aisles. And along one of the aisles, I found a can of beans. As you can see from the slide, it was a multilingual supermarket. And most of our slides will be in both English and in Hebrew for audiences of different sorts. So I found a can of beans on one of the shelves. I pulled it down and I walked down to the register. And the person at the cash register uh, waved the can of beans next to the uh, reader and said, that will be 850, please. Instead of pulling out my wallet and paying 850, I made a counter offer, counter offer of 320. At this point, when I tell this short story, People in the audience, at the very least, snicker. There are some smiles in the audience. People find this amusing, maybe even ludicrous. How is it that I think that I can haggle in a supermarket? Where did I get the gall, the chutzpah, to make a counter offer in a supermarket where prices are marked on the products? And the question is, why do some people find this funny? Why would making a counteroffer in a supermarket 
be considered something that is funny. In other words, why is what I warned you would be a joke, why is it perceived as a joke? Is it indeed funny? In regular classes, when the students are present, face to face, this is an opportunity for an interesting conversation. Actually spark up a discussion of the question of when is haggling acceptable? When is negotiation something that one should or could do? Is a supermarket an appropriate place for such negotiation? Oftentimes people say, no, you negotiate in open air markets, or you negotiate and haggle in some cultures and you don't in others, or haggling is to be expected when other norms are absent. It's interesting to examine these positions a little bit more closely because they all do not hold water. Haggling is actually much more widespread, much more prevalent, much more accepted and recognized than even we are willing to admit to ourselves in the first place. So for example, if you're going to say that haggling is something one does in a market, why shouldn't we do it in a supermarket? After all, a supermarket is a market. If haggling is something that you do not do, say, in developed or clean or well-lit places, why would one expect haggling to take place automatically, matter-of-factly, in a bank, but not in a supermarket? What are the determinants of when haggling should occur, and how haggling should occur, and when or where are haggling and negotiation and arguing over price something that really is funny or ridiculous or unaccepted. This lecture is about dynamic pricing in general, and the notion of auctions in particular, a notion that has become popular and widespread in online contexts. One of the characteristics of electronic commerce is commerce that one might title back to basics, returning to the notions of negotiation and haggling that maybe existed prior to a small window of opportunity in the 20th century when we thought prices were becoming fixed and haggling was going out the window and becoming less popular. So for example, the practice of buy me, buy you, or the practice of setting prices by somehow getting the other side to reveal their true price, not through a fixed, arbitrarily set price, but rather through a negotiation mechanism, is something that we are rediscovering. One of the problems with dynamic pricing is that it seems to be, might be ostensibly perceived, mistakenly understood, as inefficient. And the story about settling or assessing tax rates in some locations is of great interest here. In some location, the assessment of tax rates for residential property is a big issue. It becomes a big issue politically because politicians don't want to be perceived as taking too high taxes. It is a problem because if taxes are assessed by some arbitrary uh, civil servant, that could raise uh, ire against that civil servant. And so the following solution, which I find to be pretty sharp, is a dynamic pricing solution. We allow every property owner to state their own valuation for their property. So it's no longer an assessor from the government. It is you or you or he or she stating their own value for their property and taxes are calculated based on the self-assessment with one interesting proviso. If you or he or she declare too low a price, if they self-assess the value of the property as being too low, the government is entitled to buy that property at the price assessed by the owner. The result being that people are very cautious about under-assessing. This is a negotiation or dynamic pricing arrangement where you can allow dynamic prices to replace fixed prices 
to the benefit of everyone involved. The seller and the buyer both benefit from a more just, more equitable arrangement of assessing the price. Compare this in your mind to an arbitrary way of assessing prices where someone from the government would assess the price. Almost unavoidably, that would be a less just and certainly a less acceptable way of doing things. It's a good introduction for the notion of dynamic pricing. Pricing that is generated on the fly as we go and hopefully is both more efficient and more just. So when are auctions and dynamic pricing generally used? I'd like to argue that dynamic pricing and auctions are useful when we sell materials or services that are of an undetermined quality. I'd like to also suggest that this system is useful and perhaps even favorable or preferable when the goods or services that are being sold don't have a fixed or determined market value or when the seller is unsure of the price he or she can get. Choosing to sell an item under dynamic pricing conditions is more flexible for obvious reasons. It is also, perhaps surprisingly, less time consuming and also less expensive than negotiating a price. I'm giving this lecture in Haifa, which is, among other things, a port town. And at the port, every morning, the fishermen dock with the fish that they collected overnight. And the way they sell the fish is through dynamic pricing rather than fixed prices, primarily because this is how they can sell the fish in the quickest manner, before the fish start to stink. So Haifa smells good because of dynamic pricing. And it's one way of getting the, sa the sales uh, done faster. Dynamic prices and auctions can be used for single items, such as auctions when works of art are sold. And they can also be used for multiple units of a homogeneous item, such as gold or treasury securities. The central bank in most countries auctions off the available funds for every day's currency trading through auctions. So it's everything from fish through art through flowers to treasury securities that can be sold in dynamic pricing. And in electronic commerce contexts, this is done more and more in dynamic prices online. The central sentence, maybe the central message of this lecture, is the sentence that I am circling here. The argument that everything is becoming negotiable that while it may have been a stereotype that modern days are about fixed prices, that the more developed way of doing things is by doing away with the ancient, perhaps primitive ways of negotiating and haggling, it is actually the case that electronic commerce, electronic business is bringing us back to the basics of economics, the basics of negotiating everything. The term auction in English, as is the case in many other languages, is derived from the Latin auctio, which means to increase or to raise. But not all auctions are about raising. Some auctions are, in fact, about lowering the price. Some auctions operate sidewise. So, in fact, it's interesting to look at the terminology that is thousands of years old and realize how it is not necessarily up to date. We already mentioned that auctions are useful for price discovery and that auctions are useful for moving merchandise and services quickly. We should ask ourselves, is everything auctionable? Can we sell through dynamic pricing every single service and product? Or are auctions to be reserved for just one section of the economy, for one kind of commerce? It's an ethical question. It's also a managerial question. It is, in fact, an engineering question. Should it be possible to auction off online, at a distance, anything? Or should we build electronic commerce contexts and arenas? Should we build those 
with fixed price in mind more than dynamic pricing. We should argue and point to the fact that B2C or business to consumer pricing is growing and C2C, consumer to consumer dynamic pricing, is growing even faster. The numbers over the years since electronic commerce was introduced are pretty amazing in terms of size. Government is operating in dynamic prices and dynamic pricing contexts. Businesses operate in dynamic pricing contexts. And we're seeing these dynamic pricing arrangements appear in various arenas. Our purpose in the next few minutes is to understand how all of this operates, to answer the question we posed a minute ago over whether everything is auctionable. Given that everything is becoming negotiable, should we accept this notion? Should we follow this motion? Should we accept the drive towards making everything dynamically priced? Or should we set limits? Is this not appropriate for all sorts of goods and services? When I raise this question, one of the stories I tell is a story about Amazon, the big bookseller that has since become a large market for other prices, where it was discovered in the end of 2006 and the beginning of 2007, this is the dawn of the electronic commerce age, it was discovered that Amazon engaged in dynamic pricing of a sort that was less expected. It wasn't just negotiation or haggling at the cash register, as our story or joke illustrated earlier. It was dynamic pricing of a different sort. Amazon, as is described in this LA Times expose, changed the prices between the time someone figuratively put a product in the shopping cart and the time they arrived at the cash register. There was nothing illegal about their action. They were above board. It was all transparent. They told the customers that this is what they were doing. But they did exploit the opportunity of uncovering the existence of a demand and setting a different price after the demand was uncovered. This is a form of dynamic pricing that isn't initiated by the customer. It's initiated by the merchant. And one should ask, is this acceptable? Is this something that you would be willing to live with? Is it something that you think is ethical? Is it something that should be legal? You can settle this. It is legal. You can also settle the ethical question. It is only questionably ethical. And clearly, Amazon retracted this practice after a public furor arose in opposition to this. But it's another illustration of dynamic pricing, in this case, initiated by the merchant. The story about dynamic pricing with websites varying prices and deals based on information about the user is a proof of the fact that dynamic pricing is possible. It is in fact more attractive, even more attractive in electronic commerce contexts. And it's not just something that you will find in a market that is more primitive. It is something that we will see incorporated and implemented more and more in electronic commerce contexts because it is possible, because the merchant knows more and more about the customer, because through access logs and other forms of surveillance, we can second guess the behavior of the customer. Because of all of these websites already vary prices depending on the customer, the context, the time, and so forth, and they will do so even more. Dynamic pricing is something we should understand if we want to understand electronic commerce. So let's offer some definitions for auctions. Let's define dynamic pricing and auctions as a competition-based method of allocating scarce goods. In other words, this is the ultimate perfect or pure market. An auction offers the advantage of simplicity in determining market-based prices. From the point of view of market aficionados, 
dynamic pricing is the uh, expression of the ultimate pure market. We can also define that dynamic pricing and auctions are efficient because they ensure that resources accrue to those who value them the most. This is what we expect the theoretical model of a market to achieve. Sellers receive the collective assessment of the value. The auctioneers doesn't have to be the owner. The auctioneer can be an employee of the owner. Rules in the definition of the classic auction dynamic pricing, rules are set by the seller while the price is set by the bidder. This is the essential core value of dynamic pricing. Rules set by the seller, prices set by the bidder, and supposedly everybody should be happy. Remember the cake, the cake riddle? Can we use this sort of rule where rules are set by the seller, say the parent dividing the cake, while prices are set by the buyer, say the children who are the intended recipients of the cake, can we use this definition of dynamic pricing to solve the cake allocation problem? A point to think about. In any case, auctions and dynamic pricing are the most efficient and purest of markets. And from the point of view of theoretical economists, probably the best solution. We still need to ask, are auctions the most fair mechanism? That is, if we're going to use this mechanism to divide cakes, we're going to use this mechanism to allocate treasury securities, if we're going to use this mechanism to govern commerce, Will we not just be efficient, will we also be fair and accepted? Auctions are very popular in, in fact, they are the rule of the land in business-to-business -business contexts. Auctions are the way businesses buy and sell from each other. In fact, if businesses buy and sell under non-dynamic pricing arrangements, they probably need to explain because dynamic pricing is the way to do business in business-to-business -business contexts. What we need to find out is whether dynamic pricing is a good system for business-to-consumer arrangements. And again, in a face-to-face -face class, what I do is I play the auction a dollar game to illustrate the dynamics and the psychology and the process of auctions once you are part of it. Although everything is becoming negotiable, despite the fact that dynamic pricing is becoming the rule of the land, even though this is becoming more and more accepted, most people, I find, even in managerial classes, even in the MBA classes that I teach, most people have very little experience in participating in auctions. It is still something that people have not really internalized. And so this game that I play with the classes that when I teach this course is a useful way of bringing up the idea of dynamic pricing and also exposing some of its soft points. I propose the following rules. I propose for the auction a dollar game a rule that says anyone can play and the highest bidder gets it. Both highest and second highest bidder pay. Payment is to occur online in view of a class. All bids are public, audible, and not sealed, and to be made in view of the class. No union, monopoly, or rings are allowed. Time is money, I declare, and I pull out a dollar bill or a $10 bill and offer it for sale. Mm -hmm. Without an exception, students jump up and offer a nickel or a dime or a quarter or a few cents as their first offer in this dynamic pricing exercise. And the bidding begins and it ascends very quickly. And only at one point, some of the participants remember to look at rule number three, the rule that says both highest and second highest bidder pay. In other words, whoever jumps into the fray here is going to lose money. Because even if I sell the $10 for $6, the person who offered $5 will also be required to pay. In other words, I just sold $10 for $11, and the person who paid, 
who was second, who offered five dollars, is going to lose five dollars and get nothing. So they will offer seven dollars, and the bidding com competition will continue. And if you think about the dynamics or the game theoretic characteristics of this deceptively simple game, you will see that the seller always wins. Anyone who participates always loses. It is an example of where dynamic pricing is actually neither fair nor acceptable. And yet, people clamor to participate. People want to be part of this. People are deaf to the limitations. No matter how colorful the rules are posted, how big the font with the rules, uh, where the rules are displayed uh, is, no matter how slowly the rules are explained, auctions and dynamic pricing, as is, can be seen in this example, are a trap where many people can fall and much value can be lost. This example that is always a good eye-opener for what are some of the drawbacks of the supposedly pure, ultimate, unassailable free market is a good introduction for us to think about terminology and different characteristics of dynamic pricing markets. If indeed everything is becoming negotiable, if indeed auctions are becoming more and more popular, if indeed this will become the governing way through which more and more business is conducted and more and more management takes place, we need to understand the terminology. We need to understand the differences between different types of dynamic pricing. Not all dynamic prices are the same. Not all auction arenas are identical. Systems vary by whether they are anonymous or not. Systems vary by the degree of confidentiality. The anonymity is whether or not the participant, the buyer, is known to others. Confidentiality is whether the identity of the winners is revealed. And remember the term winners, we'll come back to that in a short while. Systems and arenas differ by whether or not secrecy is reserved about inventory amounts. Does everyone know how many different items are on sale? Different systems employ different rules regarding timing. For example, when is the auction over? Can the seller extend the time at their whim? Is valuation, that is, is the price on the market for a particular item, good, or service known to everyone? Or is it kept secret? Is it a discriminative system when different buyers can so-called win with different prices? Or is the price, when it is set, applied to everyone? Are there other restrictions? Are increments enforced? And is there a reserve price that the buyer knows but can be changed? Is there a certain level under which bids will not be accepted? And is the seller allowed to enforce a reserve price without disclosing it in advance? All of these are items that determine the arena of auctions. All of these make auctions uh, vary and create a different set of rules that create a different environment and atmosphere for buyers and sellers. There are different valuations, private and public valuations. There is what the seller knows is the value of a particular good on sale or a particular service on sale. And there's what the buyer knows is the price that they would probably be asked for in a different context. Private valuations vary and public valuations vary. It changes very significantly when personal consumption is involved as opposed to when this is public consumption. Common valuation is something that would affect the utility and the fairness of such systems quite importantly. 
In talking about auctions, in an introductory lecture about auctions and about dynamic pricing, we should familiarize ourselves with four basic systems. What is called the English ascending price arrangement, the Dutch descending price arrangement, the first price sealed bid arrangement, and what is called the Vickery or second price sealed bid auction arena. These are the four basic arenas that I'd like to introduce and survey. These are the four systems that we need to understand for us to make decisions about using dynamic prices in management and in commerce settings. All of the terminology that we illustrated earlier when we talked about auction text terminology, the anonymity, confidentiality, secrecy, timing, valuation, discriminative, is discriminative issues, whether or not increments are enforced, and the issue of reserve price, all of these create a fairly complex and rich map of possible auction contexts. And if we're going to computerize these contexts, if we're going to place dynamic pricing arrangements online, we will need to make decisions about each one of these junctions. We need to decide about confidentiality, about secrecy, about privacy, about timing, about discriminative pricing, and so forth. And these make for a fairly rich set of possibilities with auctions and pricing. Let's talk a little bit about the classification of different systems. The English auction, the Dutch auction, the first price sealed bid or discriminatory sales arrangement, and the Vickery auction. Uh, with the English auction, which is the most popular, well-known system, what we have is an audible bid, open outcry, ascending price. This is the auction or the dynamic pricing arrangement that everyone's familiar with. This is the auction or dynamic pricing uh, system that is popular in the movies. You see this in Hollywood products. You also see this in uh, public auctions when, for example, police sell stolen goods that were recovered. Uh, this is the auction that most of us associate in our minds when we think about dynamic pricing. In these auctions, reserve price plays a very important role because this is where the seller can try to trick the buyer into thinking that great opportunities are to be had and any bid would be accepted, but they won't sell unless a bid is given that exceeds the reserve price. In this sort of auction, the roles of anonymity play the most important role, and it is in this sort, sort of action where uh, we see behaviors of the like uh, we're familiar with in arts sales, and Sotheby's and Christie's, and so forth. This is where the gavel has become popular and is known. It's called the English auction everywhere in the world except in England where in England it is referred to as a Yankee auction. It doesn't really matter. The label is, is an arbitrary label. This is the standard or default dynamic pricing auction. It's a standard or default system, but probably very rare in electronic commerce contexts. In electronic commerce contexts, on the net, when we do things through internet arrangements, we rarely see English auction arrangements for a variety of reasons. Some of them have to do with efficiency, some of them have to do with justice, and some of them have to do with public perception. More interesting, much more sophisticated, a little bit more surprising, and less known is something called the Dutch auction. The Dutch auction is a system made popular in the Dutch flower markets. The Dutch auction is the dynamic pricing arrangement implemented in the Netherlands when large amounts of flowers, tulips raised in the Netherlands, flowers flown in from other flower growing countries such as Israel, flown into the large Schiphol airport outside of Amsterdam. 
These flowers are sold to buyers. In this picture, we can see one of the arenas for market selling. In these arenas, you can see the buyers seated in an amphitheater facing the big carts in which flowers are brought in on display. But most importantly, you see these big clocks on the front wall in front of them, these big clocks that are important in implementing the Dutch auction arrangement, arrangement in which the price doesn't ascend as in the English auction, the price descends. In Dutch auctions what we have is a descending price, a system where the winner determines the price by stopping a dropping clock. Flowers and fish, credit and antiques can be sold under this system where the goods to be sold or the services to be rendered are on display and a large clock is displayed in front of the buyers. We can see one nervous buyer, two nervous buyers on the phone over here in this picture waiting to see the flowers being drawn in and facing a large descending clock, a clock where the price set by the clock is a very high price and the clock's arm starts to drop counterclockwise until the first buyer presses a button. You can see the right arm of both of these buyers is poised over a button and they will hit the button when the arm of the clock reaches a price that they're willing to, to pay. The first bidder who hits their button gets the goods and pays the price that the clock points at when they pay the price. The psychology here plays an enormous role. Psychology is the psychology of the buyer facing the clock with the dropping price, looking at the numbers rolling in front of their eyes mm -hmm. and stopping the clock at the point that they're willing to pay and they are under enormous pressure because all the other buyers might hit the button just a fraction of a second ahead of them. Because this is a relatively novel system and because the psychology plays such a, an important role here, we built a computerized simulation to illustrate this as part of a research project that we're involved in. Uh, we've been doing studies of online auctions and computer-mediated communication or electronic commerce. We built simulations for both the English auction that we talked about earlier and the Dutch auction. The simulation is available here and everyone is invited to make use of it. I would like to illustrate the Dutch auction for just a second with you. Uh, we'll be using the online simulation. In this online simulation, Natalia, can I use you as an example? Uh, Natalia will be a participant, anyone can be a participant, and we will start the auction. And in this auction, what Natalia is offered is to buy this box of chocolate. And she knows that this box of chocolate is available on the outside market. Her private valuation for this, the purposes of this example is $9. So she can go outside and buy this box of chocolates, not through electronic commerce, in a fixed price market for $9. She's also facing this clock that is now offering this box of chocolate for $10. And she knows that this arm of the clock will now begin to go counterclockwise to the left, dropping the price. Once it reaches a point that Natalia is willing to pay, she can click on the button that says bid. This all becomes complicated and interesting because there are other competitors in the market who might be interested in bidding for this box of chocolate. So Natalia is between the market value of $9, her deep desire for chocolate, and the realization that some other people are there and they might also bid for the box of chocolate. Some of the terms we mentioned earlier, such as anonymity and secrecy and timing and reserve price and discrimination, all come up here. For example, Natalia might at this point be thinking about the question, how many boxes of chocolate are available for sale? Would there be other boxes that she might be interested in buying? In any case, once Natalia tells me that she's 
ready, we can click on the begin button and click on the ready button. The clock will start dropping. If Natalia is an astute e-commerce student, she will not click on the bid button until the arm drops below $9. She knows that she can buy it for $9 elsewhere. Why would she buy it here? But once it drops below $9, any price below $9 would be good. The lower, the better. So Natalia, let me know when you're ready. And also, when you're ready, tell me to stop on the bid. You're ready. Natalia was a little bit too slow. Israel click on the bid button ahead of her, and bought the ch box of chocolate for $8.44. 56 cents lower than the market price. So he, in a fraction of a second, won at least 56, seconds, 56 cents, not to mention a tasty box of chocolate. Uh, do you want to do it again, Nat Natalia? Yes, she says, of course. There's free money to be won here. Ready to go? Let's go. Too late. Israel got it again, and this time for and he this time he won fifty cents. Let's do it a third time. Ready to go? This time Natalia got it and actually bought it for eight dollars. What was it? Seven dollars and seventy cents for a net gain of a dollar thirty. The auction results in this case allowed her to use the Dutch descending system. It also illustrated some of the psychological pressures involved in buying under this system. In these Dutch arenas, whether they're in the Netherlands or elsewhere, we see that auctions are not necessarily about increasing price. They could be about decreasing price. We see that in these arenas, it is not necessarily the case that uh, it should take a long time. It could all be a lot slower. Uh, it can also be a lot faster. One should begin to think about the fit between the method, the arena system, and the goods or services you want to sell, as well as the market in which you operate. When electronic commerce embraces dynamic pricing, one of the first and most important decisions is whether we're going to implement an ascending price system or a descending price system. Which is best for the product, which is best for the seller, which is best for the buyer. The psychology is important, time consumption is important, and perceptions of fairness are important. And this is where we can go back to the riddle about the cake. Can we use either the English or the Dutch auction mechanism to solve the problem of allocating the scarce resource of a chocolate cake among feuding children? And the answer is, we can actually use both, but the English auction would be very complicated. For six-year-olds or four-year-olds, the concept of a bidding war would be very complicated. However, the Dutch auction is so simple to grasp that we can implement it even with very young children who are not even able to read or write. We just tell them, here's a cake, a knife will be moved over the surface of the cake, and as soon as you're happy with the size of the piece on this side of the knife, you just say so. In the same way that Nad Natalia was waiting there with her, button over, with her finger over the bidding button to say, this is a price I'm willing to pay for the box of chocolate, we can have children declare their valuation for the piece of cake and use the Dutch auction mechanism to solve what seems to be a classic resource allocation problem. And we can do this over the internet with the same sort of efficiency. The third form of auction is probably the most familiar and most widely implemented, and that is simply the sealed bid sale. It's not really an auction because it's not an open outcry, but we have governments and businesses declare open dynamic pricing arrangements where a set of goods 
or services is put on offer, bids are made in sealed envelopes, and at a certain pre-declared time, the envelopes are opened, and the highest bidder wins. Again, that term, winner, wins the right to purchase that good at the highest price that they offered. It actually turns out that the English auction and the Dutch auction and the sealed bid dynamic pricing arrangement all share one big deficiency, one important weakness, one big problem that has caused generations of economists to lose sleep. The problem is that while auctions and dynamic prices promise the advantages of a free and open market, promise the setting of a price that is indisputably fair for everyone, it actually is disputable. And the dispute is over the observation that in dynamic prices implemented through English auctions and Dutch auctions, what we find is not the most fair price, what we, more likely find to f what we are more likely to find is the single loser remaining in the world willing to pay a price that no one else is willing to pay. So looking at auctions and dynamic prices from that perspective, what you see is that they are not as fair, they are not as attractive, they are not as free from problems as could be perceived in, at first glance. And economists are worried about this because economists would like to have free market arrangements because all of the mathematics of, math of economic analysis point to free and open markets as being a much more just and much more efficient solution. And so for generations, people were worried about this concept of the winner's curse. The winner's curse is the notion that if you win in an auction, you so-called are declared the winner, you're actually a loser. You have been determined to be the single stupid person remaining in the bidding where everyone else has already given up. Furthermore, as might have been seen in the Dutch auction example, can certainly be seen in English auction ascending price arrangements, and is always the case in sealed bid auctions. We need to be worried about participants' willingness to disclose their true value. In markets, when haggling is present, when negotiation takes place, everyone is a little bit cautious, suspicion abounds, and we have a real problem of getting the seller and the buyer to meet when they both actually value the good or service on sale at the same place. But because of negotiation dynamics, neither is willing to disclose their true valuation. If I, disclose, if I disclose my true valuation in a haggling or negotiation position, the other side might say, okay, I'll bid you a little bit higher and try to pull me closer to them, higher than what I would get if I pre-state a lower price. So these are two problems. One is the winner, winner's curse problem, the fact that it seems surprisingly to be the case that in auctions and dynamic pricing settings, we curse the winner. And the other problem is the problem of getting people to disclose their true valuation so as to encourage more commerce to take place. There's actually a whole branch in the psychology of economic behavior that studies the fact that there is underperformance of the market, that there are many cases of deals that are not struck, although both sides would benefit from these deals, just because of the problem of disclosing true, true price. The winner's curse, formally defined, is the situation where the winner actually bids 
the furthest from what would have been the average bid. And so the winner is actually pushed to go away from a best estimate of the item's actual worth. What we want to do is to find a solution, to build a mechanism, to design an online or non-online mechanism that would allow dynamic pricing, would create auctions without having the curse of the winner's curse. The good news is that a famous economist by the name of William Vickery actually came up with a solution for the winner's curse problem. One of the more interesting developments in auction theory and in dynamic pricing arrangements is William Vickery's contribution to auction theory, the suggestion of a fourth mode beyond the English auction mode and the Dutch auction mode and the sealed bid auction or dynamic pricing mode. We have a fourth mode, a mode proposed for the first time by William Vickery in 1961 and a mode for which he later was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics. It's actually a mode that has been used in the 19th century, since the 19th century, by stamp collectors, but has now become a prevalent mode of dynamic pricing and auctions on the internet or online. William Vickery suggested that instead of having an ascending price and awarding the purchase to the winner who offers the most in an English auction or to the winner who presses the button first in a Dutch auction, we should have a sealed bid auction in which the participant who offered the highest price gets to buy it. But the price that is assessed is not the price that they offered, but rather a price offered by the second highest bidder. The argument first proposed theoretically and over the last years proven empirically, the argument of the Vickery auction is that that would result in truer price revelations, in statements that would be more honest, in much more efficient markets, many more occasions when buyer and seller get to meet each other and deals get struck, and in a reduction, most importantly, a reduction in the psychological pressure of participating in such auctions. In Vickery's arrangement, the highest bidder wins, but he or she only pays what the second highest bidder offered to pay. And so a Vickery auction is an auction where the second price is set and it is still a sealed bid auction. Vickery won the Nobel Prize. He's one of the very few Nobel Prize laureates who won the prize but didn't live to receive the prize. When he was told that he won the prize, he got a heart attack and died on the spot. And that's another way to remember the winner's curse. The problem that he solved is also a problem that was his end. So to summarize, four systems, English auction, Dutch auction, sealed bid, and second price sealed bid. The second price sealed bid Vickery auction is especially important because it is a very sophisticated solution, but even more so because it is now the most popular way in which deals are actually conducted in electronic commerce. All of eBay transactions are run using Vickery auctions. All of Google and Yahoo's pricing for advertising is done through Vickery second price sealed bid auctions. Most governments do most of their auctions of both buying and selling through second price sealed bid Vickery solutions to the winner's curse. So it has become an alternative widely used in electronic commerce and probably one of the most important mechanism design notions in electronic commerce markets. Sealed bid, second price systems are the rule of the land in terms of dynamic pricing 
And because they are a little bit complicated, because they are a little bit surprising in Notion, they are important to know about. If you bought something on eBay, you have most likely been charged a price that is a little lower than the price that you offered because it is a second price sealed bid auction. If you buy an advertising arrangement over AdSense or AdWords on Google, you have most likely been charged a little bit less than what you bid. Again, because the system in rule is the Vickrey system. Dynamic pricing now meets electronic commerce because, for example, Google pricing takes place millions of times every day. It is a very, very popular system, and one we need to know about. Since electronic commerce has now moved into a mobile commerce revolution, people doing more and more of their buying on tablets and smartphones, wherever they are, not nailed to a particular place, this business of dynamic pricing becomes even more important in the development of applications that implement this and the systems that either implement a Dutch auction or an English auction or a sealed bid auction or a Vickery second price sealed bid auction become increasingly important every day. There are a variety of strategies that one needs to know about when dealing with auctions and there is an enormous and growing literature on when to participate in one kind of auction or another and how to participate in one kind of auction or another. There are variations on the four basic models, the Dutch, English, sealed bid, and second price. For example, there are double auctions, there are reverse auctions, there are typical auctions where the seller sells to a variety of buyers, and there are reverse auctions where the buyer actually auctions off among different sellers. Online, the implementation of these various molds, things called mechanism design for online auctions, whether these are typical auctions or reverse auctions, online, the development of such systems becomes very interesting. In reverse auctions, for example, used by the Department of Defense and other federal agencies in the United States, in reverse auctions, what we get is a surprising reversal of roles. One of the most famous examples is a system first implemented by a website called Priceline, where what is sold is not the good or service, but rather the demand. And the seller is an intermediary, not the provider of the services or the goods, and not the customer, but rather an intermediary whose role it is to aggregate the demand of multiple number of customers and auction off that demand to the providers of, in this case, travel services, airline tickets, hotel rooms, cars for rent, and so forth. Priceline actually has a patent on this mechanism design, a mechanism that turns the tables around. Rather than offering a good for the highest bidder, what Priceline does is to aggregate the demand at lower prices, prices that are lower than the market, and turn around and auction off that demand to the airlines or the hotel chains or the car rental agencies, auctioning that demand to those willing to offer it for the lowest price. It's a double reverse auction and it is so sophisticated that Priceline was awarded a patent for this system, a patent that allows them to implement this system for uh, the last 15 or so years uh, in a sole arrangement. In a few years their patent will run out and we will see many more electronic commerce arrangements emulating this system once the patent becomes available to everyone. So reverse auctions such as the, one, the ones implemented in, by Priceline make dynamic pricing interesting in electronic commerce arenas even more so. As I mentioned earlier, there are many auction types, the four basic types that we mentioned, the English, the Dutch, the sealed price, and the second price sealed bid uh, can be vary, varied into further uh, variations. There's simultaneous bidding, there's haphazard or random order bidding, there's handshake uh, auctions conducted in the 
Chinese countryside, there are whisper-based auctions, candlelight auctions, silent auctions, and Swiss auctions that allow regret, so you can bid and you can then regret the bid. Uh, all of these variations create interesting mechanism designs that have their emulations and expressions in online contexts and in electronic commerce connections. In this connection, I would like to recommend Charles Smith's study of the social construction of auctions, the behavior of individuals and crowds in auction arrangements. When auctions and dynamic pricing are brought to online contexts, the behavior, both the psychology and the sociology, becomes very interesting and offers opportunities for exploitation. One cannot talk about dynamic pricing in auctions without talking about the failure of such markets in the context of fraud and abuse. Auction markets are particularly prone to fraud. There are more opportunities and many more complaints about fraud in online contexts when auctions and dynamic pricing are present. There's a certain sentiment or gut feeling of seediness or problem, even if it's not justified, even if it's not true. Fraud and abuse are a big suspicion in auction and dynamic pricing. And because they are a big suspicion, there is much criticism. Another source I would recommend to read in the context of discussing dynamic pricing is a study of dynamic pricing published by Wired magazine, a study titled Going, Going, Gone, Who C Kills the Internet Auction? Let me rest you assured, the internet auction is not dead. It wasn't killed, but there are many who would like to have it killed. The, the negative sentiment associated with dynamic pricing is quite high. As a result, systems such as sniping, where there are mechanized, computerized systems put into place to aid last-minute bids, to aid predatory behavior in the context of such markets, are prevalent. And uh, there are systems such as auction stealer and auction blitz and bid nip whose even titles disclose their intent. Their intent is to give some bidders an advantage, some people might say an unfair advantage, in the competition with other bidders. So what was supposed to be a pure free market arrangement suddenly becomes an environment where either fraud or technology harnessed to the benefit of the few are in place. Auctions, to put it in short terms, could be trouble. Because they could be trouble, the technology associated with them is problematic. There are collusion issues and there are tricks associated with auctions. There are a variety of manipulation opportunities and there is therefore a serious problem with trust. Trust among potential participants and even more problems of trust among those who refuse to even take part. This suspicion of seediness is prevalent. It's also a business opportunity. If people are suspicious, if there is extra caution, if there are concerns about fraud, if there are well-known tactics and players who try to bend what is supposed to be a free market. If all of this exists, there is also an opportunity to make money. And so systems for escrow that do the negotiation in between to achieve trust where one doesn't exist. And credit and evaluation and performance data are all available. And in online arrangements, they become even more available to make up for and compensate for the fraud and trust problems. In fact, the largest fraud and trust solutions are available in systems, such as the eBay system, where the big innovation is not the creation of the market. Market has existed many, many, many centuries before the internet. It is in harnessing the electronic commerce and online arrangements 
to deal with the trust issue. And one of eBay's biggest innovations, emulated by many others as well, is building systems that allow buyers and sellers to generate information and to enforce trust ideas about the buyers and sellers on the other side of the network. And so information about other participants, whether or not their prior behavior was trusty, whether or not their services were as promised, whether or not they behaved according to what was offered, whether or not their products were worthwhile. Are the actual work in online sites. It's creating the trust and ratings systems that is the bread and butter of dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing is not just about the theoretical idea of having the price varied. It's the mechanism designed around it that governs the way the price varies, governs the way the seller creates the rules, governs the way the buyer determines the price, and most importantly, governs the way in which trust is enforced. eBay has done a stellar job in this. Other sites are doing interesting innovations. We cannot discuss dynamic pricing met methods and models without taking these into account. So to conclude, Online au auctions are becoming popular because retailing is moving away from a fixed price paradigm. Negotiation is becoming more and more prevalent. Because we have online arrangements, this has a wide geographic reach and is available to anyone anywhere, with mobile arrangements even more so. Automated negotiations are both inexpensive and quick. It is a vibrant research area. Vickery made his contribution in the 1960s, but there is an enormous challenge and opportunity for research into various aspects of dynamic pricing, both on the social side and on the technological side. The benefits of dynamic pricing are numerous, and they include liquidity and price discovery, and price transparency and market efficiency, and lowering the transaction costs and aggregating consumers and the opportunities hidden in network effects. All of these are true for pure markets and implemented in the most complete way in dynamic pricing arrangements. There are also risks and costs for dynamic prices. And if you're going to go into this field, either as a seller or, or as a buyer, you need to do the due diligence of realizing the risks and the costs for both consumers and businesses in auctions. The basics are in these systems that we mentioned, the English system, the Dutch system, the sealed price system, and the Vickery system. And every decision maker is responsible for realizing the factors that need to be considered when moving into a dynamic price arrangement. You need to think about the various determinants of the proposed deal and think about the various designs or mechanism designs of arenas so that you can choose the right solution or implement the appropriate solution. So I thank you. I'd like to encourage you to be in touch if you've watched this video. This is my email address and this is the URL for my homepage. Here at the Center for Internet Research, we will continue to do research on dynamic prices uh, of this sort we will also be interested in continuing the effects of the Tempest Project and electronic commerce. We'll be happy to entertain questions.